There has been an absolutely huge update to the IUCN red list that determines what species are threatened with extinction. Today's video, we're going to break down the IUCN red list itself and discuss some of these exciting updates, uh, as well as thousands upon thousands of new species being assessed. So uh, before we get into it, this video is sponsored by myself. Uh, so subscribe to me on Patreon, like, comment, subscribe, do all those fun things, uh, but I'm not going to waste your time too much. Let's get into it. Let's start this video by just briefly covering what the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species is. Uh, so this is a organizing body, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN. They are a organization that facilitates all of the threatened assessments for species. So if you've ever heard uh, elephants are an endangered species, this is the the uh, source of that information. And so it's made up of a bunch of different working groups that are specialists in a particular field. So there's a turtle working group, there's an amphibian working group, and with those they can actually be subdivided into uh, freshwater fishes or uh, timber species of trees. Um, so, but what's incredible is that a lot of this information is uh, publicly available. Um, at least on the individual species level. So for example, if we want to look at the African savanna elephant, uh, we can see that it is endangered. Uh, there are many categories that we'll discuss in just a second. Uh, but we can also see population trends. We can see rough ranges that includes uh, this yellow is their current actual range uh, with... Uh, possibly extinct ranges, and just a whole slew of information about why a particular organism has been assessed to be uh, endangered or least concerned. So these are all of the categories of the IUCN uh, that are used. So not evaluated means it's not evaluated. Data deficient just means that we don't really have enough data to make good claims about this species. Um, a lot of taxa are data deficient. Uh, least concern is what we'd expect. This animal's of very, very least concern. Uh, these are kind of what we want all taxa to be at, but some are always going to be threatened by nature of uh, small populations or restricted ranges, right? Uh, then we have near threatened. So this is a category that means that these, the taxa is uh, at risk of being threatened. And then we have the threatened categories. Those are uh, vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered. Uh, so vulnerable means that it's vulnerable to going extinct. Endangered, of course, is a... Uh, it's endangered. It has a higher risk of going extinct. And then there's critically endangered, which is a very, very high risk of going extinct. And uh, then we have extinct in the wild. We'll actually loop back to this in a second. And then we have the taxa is fully extinct. Uh, so extinct in the wild means that it's still surviving in, in zoos, for example, but it cannot be found in the wild. And of course, the, the reasons for why a particular organism is assessed to be something is, is is found on their web page so we can see that elephant populations are decreasing um, we can actually see the populations in detail so the african elephant status report in 2016 estimated a continental population of around 415,000 for both african savanna african forest elephants and uh they have reported a continental decline of approximately 111,000 elephants since 2006. Um, so what, what I'm really trying to get as the IUCN is an incredible, incredible, incredible resource. And uh, so much conservation work would not be possible without it. Um, so here we can all see different threats. So with elephants, it's just kind of everything. Um, we see uses in trade, so of course, um, handicrafts, jewelry, etc. It's not used locally, it's not used nationally, but it is used internationally. Um, as pets, display animals, uh, not used locally because of the X, but they are as pets or display animals nationally and internationally. Um, so yeah, so this is really what the IUCN Red List excels in. Um, I actually use the IUCN Red List data in, in, my, in, in my research pretty often, whether it is the range maps of where species are found, or it is the conservation uh, tools, the, the metrics that we have with this. Uh, there are some really interesting methodologies that you can use with IUCN Red List data. Uh, but let's now transition and talk about the update to this Red List. This article came across my newsfeed titled Freshwater Fish Highlight Escalating Climate Impacts on Species. Um, it does give a very good overview as towards this update. Um, so this update was released at COP28 UN Climate Conference in the UAE, uh, and it includes the first global freshwater fish assessments 
and highlights the impact of illegal logging and trade on mahogany. Um, this is a very relevant issue towards uh, my own research and myself. Uh, a lot of my work is down in Belize where mahogany uh, logging and trade, especially legal uh, mahogany logging, is still an active area of conservation concern, as well as one that has a historical influence throughout the whole region. So what we're going to do is we're going to break down this article. I do have a few other articles that we will use to supplement this information. Um, but of course, everything is down in the description. So if you want to read more information, um, you can. Uh, so let's start with the state of the freshwater fish species. There is an incredible diversity of freshwater fish. Uh, consider this quote, freshwater fishes make up more than half of the world's known fish species, an incomprehensible diversity given that freshwater ecosystems comprise only 1%, 1% of aquatic habitat. And so these fishes, um, of, of course, it's, it's incredible when you think that three quarters of the earth is covered by uh, salt water. And then uh, of the total aquatic habitat on this planet, 1%. 1% is freshwater, yet half of the fish species are found there. However, they are under threat. Um, so if we look at the causes, 57% uh, are affected by pollution, 17% are affected by climate change, 45% are affected by dams and water extraction, 25% uh, extraction. Uh, are affected by overfishing, and invasive species and disease harm 33%. Uh, so the cool thing about the IUCN, maybe cool, maybe not, is that we can actually track changes in species uh, assessment listings over time. So one example they show is the Lake Turkana robber, which is Brysinus ferox. It has moved from least concern to vulnerable. Uh, so here is a, um, an image of this species on fish base, which houses a lot of information about fish, uh, particularly those that are economically important. So it just gives a little bit of a description, some information. Uh, so this you can see here, this is a very old, not very old, uh, this is an old uh, IUCN red list status. It was last assessed in 2006. However, on the newest assessment, they have listed it as a vulnerable species. So uh, freshwater fish are underneath a lot of different threats, despite them being uh, possessing an incredible diversity. Uh, so we're going to keep moving through this, though. Uh, we also talk about this article talks about the Central South Pacific, East Pacific green sea turtles at risk of extinction. Uh, they are respectively endangered and vulnerable. Uh, so this is the Central South Pacific and East Pacific uh, green turtles, uh, Chelonia mitis. So climate change is a growing threat. Uh, these species, these species of turtle, have eggs that the temperature determines the sex of the offspring. Uh, so climate change, if things move to an average uh, warmer, on average warmer, uh, this can have drastic effects on their population sex ratios. Uh, but a major cause of green turtle mortality throughout these regions is incidental bycatch in industrial and artisanal fishing. When we talk about bycatch, this is what we are talking about. Bycatch is when you catch a non-target species. So say they, uh, the fishermen are going out and trying to catch um, tuna, for example. Um, but then the sea turtles get wrapped up in the nets, um, although a lot of tuna is fish in line. doesn't matter. Uh, the example stands that turtles do get caught up in nets, and this is a major cause of mortality. There have been new designs that uh, do have bycatch reduction so that add basically a little, uh, yeah, here we go, the turtle excluder device, the TED. Um, so there's a little escape hatch for turtles, and then the target species still get captured. Uh, however, it still remains that this is a major, major issue for turtles, as well as harvesting turtles and their eggs for consumption or to sell at markets. But this update is not just doom and gloom. This is the scimitar horned oryx, a species you have likely seen in zoos, which has been brought from extinct in the wild to endangered. Uh, so this is thanks to a lot of conservation efforts out in Chad. Unfortunately, increased poaching, extreme droughts, uh, as well as uh, numerous other issues uh, led to the decline of the species until its ultimate extinction in the wild in the 20th century. However, they were found in private ranches, in zoos, etc., etc. Um, 
So today, poaching levels are rising mainly for subsistence and trade amidst high levels of poverty and food insecurity. However, we now have 140 mature individuals ranging freely in Chad with another 331 calves born there by 2021. Uh, so this is a really great conservation success story. And it is paired with the success story of the Saika antelope, which has moved from critically endangered to near threatened. This is a huge, 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 huge change in terms of their conservation. So what happened? Uh, you may have known about these species during a mass mortality event. They are highly susceptible to diseases. And uh, they've had uh, mass mortality events due to disease outbreaks in 2010, 2011, 2015, and 2016. Uh, the ones in 2015 is thought to have been triggered by abnormally high temperatures and humidities, stuff that is uh, likely to become more frequent with climate change. Uh, however, uh, the population in Kazakhstan, which most of the Kazakhstan, <laughs> which most of the Saiga antelopes are, are found in, has increased by 1,100% between 2015 and 2022 and reached 1.3 million individuals in May of 2022. So without the IUCN, we wouldn't be able to track this information as readily. Um, of course, local people know about species declines, but at a global scale, it can often be hard to understand these changes. So now we're going to move into the trees. For that, I actually want to cover this article, which I was also found through the IUCN website, uh, because they added 40,000 tree species now published on the IUCN red list, um, as well. Uh, so 40,000 total, they did 4,000 new, 70% uh, now have a uh, published IUCN Red List assessment, and they now have, uh, there's, this year has been a particular focus on the timber tree species, with the publication of Red List of Timber Trees and the Red List of Dipterocarpaceae by BGCI. Uh, the former identified a third of tree species used for timber are threatened by their use and extraction. So this is big leaf mahogany, uh, which is described as one of the most highly valued timber species in the world. Uh, there have been centuries of unsustainable uh, destruction of mahogany due to eating for uh, kitchen countertops and for uh, the international trade in timber. And the problem with this is that this is a uh, more tricky taxa to actually raise up uh, many of the mahogany that was cut down during the period of colonization in the 1700s, 1800s, even before that, um, was trees that were over 100 years old, if not several hundred years old, uh, that were indiscriminately cut down, which is not sustainable whatsoever and makes them a very tricky species to actually farm properly. Um, now, unfortunately, this species is listed as endangered. Big leaf mahogany exemplifies the need for more data to be available uh, for, to make informed decisions on management, sustainable use, and trade. Uh, what you'll often find in these conservation circles uh, with IUCN is that they are not against use and trade of, uh, of organisms, of species. Uh, really, they just want to make sure things are done sustainably. So it's the same concept as if you, if you fish all of the river, all of the fish, if you fish all of the fish out of the lake, there are no more fish to be found. Um, but if you actually maintain it for generations to come, then there, that is a conservation use. Conservation is the intersection of people with nature. And so they are very, very okay with the trade. It's just the problem is unsustainable trade. Um, so the Global Tree Assessment in its final year does publish uh, truly global updates. So they now have the comprehensive assessments for endemic trees in Mexico, Costa Rica, Guatemala, and Panama. In Southeast Asia, there's been a focus on completing taxonomic groups with, uh, for the, there we go, Artocarpus, the breadfruits, uh, Diospirus, the ebonies, Lithocarpus, the stone oaks, and Dipterocarps of DTIP. Carpaceae. So all you tree nerds, I'm sure you are loving this because this is a massive, massive update. And then one last section. This wasn't included on the original article, but I did find that they did update it for birds as well. So uh, we did find that some taxa were threatened uh, 
that, that were threatened have been reclassified as near threatened. So those are the greater and lesser adjuncts, uh, which would be these storks here. So on the left hand side is the greater adjunct stork on the right hand side is the lesser adjunct stork. And then here in the middle, this painted stork, um, that was formerly listed as near threatened, but is now listed as least concern. So this is definitely a conservation success story. These were birds that were threatened and now no longer are. Of course, for the greater and the lesser, they are still considered near threatened. Um, and there was another one. Uh, they downlisted, uh, which means that they have less threats, uh, the, from critically endangered to endangered of the Miller bird. Uh, so here, we'll open up the Miller bird in a new tab. This is a Hawaiian reed warbler. Um, it's not that bird there, uh, but it is now endangered. It is no longer critically endangered. This is fantastic. I uh, hoped they would have a picture, but it doesn't look like it. Um, and uh, but of course, other taxa such as on Hawaii, such as the uh, Ananuiu and the Kauai Amakihi, has been uplisted from vulnerable to endangered. So they actually are more threatened than we believed. Um, Hawaii is a really, really unfortunate case because of how many threats they are facing and how much extinction they've already had. Um, rising temperature, invasive alien species and disease, so feral cats are a huge one, and I know they're very worried about brown tree snakes. Um, but in, in essence, there are species in the same area that are now moving to be least concerned, less threatened, and other taxa are becoming more threatened. And these are trends that we can see over time. So we have seen the citron-throated toucan has experienced considerable population declines, moving from least concerned to near threatened. Um, and then palm cockatoo, which is actually up here on the top of article uh, that one has been uplisted from least concern to near threatened so it's not threatened yet but it is getting closer there's habitat loss um, happening that is uh, as well as uh, increasing intensities of trapping for the pet trade um, so I'm not going to go too much in depth. There's quite a few other species here, such as the cinnamon rumped trogon, which is pictured here. That one is now vulnerable. Uh, but of course, with any of these updates, there is a lot of information to parse through. And really what I want to uh, leave with you is that we, we kind of exist in a time of data. We, we know more than we ever have before. We have ways to track trends of threatened species across the globe. Uh, but data is all good, but there needs action behind it. And fortunately, there are so many amazing organizations, amazing people, and uh, yeah, amazing individuals that are utilizing this data for conservation purposes to actually save these species. So there's this weird mix as a scientist when I see a species is like now more endangered or more threatened, um, where it's, it's awful, it's terrible, but I'm also happy that we have the data to track it. Um, it's sort of a how can we know there's a problem if we don't know there's a problem sort of issue? So if you, uh, that, that's all I have for you today. If you would want to like, share, subscribe, do all those things that YouTubers tell you to do, be very much so appreciated. Also check out the description for any of the sources that I've shown here today, as well as my courses and my Patreon. Uh, thank you. That's it. Have a great day.